Yeah, welcome to the second talk of today's colloquium. Uh, we are having Rebecca Starr from National University of Singapore. So Rebecca is an associate professor of linguistics at the uh, university, and she received her PhD from Stanford University in 2012. Her research focuses on language variation, change and acquisition in multilingual contexts, and she looks at uh, various aspects of social phonetics. Her research interest is wide. I, I really recommend that you <laughs> try to uh, go to her website and see what, how many different projects uh, she's running and also looking at uh, in terms of language and society. Uh, uh, she works on these phenomena in languages, uh, including but not, limited, but not limited to English, Mandarin, Cantonese, Japanese, and Korean. So it's good to have you here at uh, today's colloquium. And uh, today, Rebecca will talk about language attitudes and exposure as predictors of phonological variation among local and expatriate children in Singapore. Please pause the recording. Um, yep, uh, thank you uh, for this interesting talk about uh, the third culture kids and uh, several various uh, things uh, that we heard. Anybody who has a question? Mm. Yeah, uh, so Shigeto Kawahara from Keio University will ask the first question. Well, thank you so much for the talk. I learned a lot. This is a new topic for me. So it may not be like the, the, the core about the core of your talk, but I'm really interested in the, the discrepancy between the when you had the rating of how likely the each speech is produced by um, Australian speakers and Singaporean English speakers. And you said that despite the fact that almost all the teachers are Singaporean English speakers, they judged about half of them as not being teachers. Is that right? Right. Um, so um, like many theories, like exemplar theory or you know, Bayesian reasoning, they all just believe, well, that wouldn't be able to explain that discrepancy. Do, do you have thoughts about why that is coming yeah. from? Yeah, well, I can talk more about this. We, we talk more about this in the paper um, in regarding this, this perception task. But um, one of the very interesting things that we found in terms of exemplar theory is that um, the ratings for these accents in this occupation task really did seem to correlate with the overall prestige of the accent rather than with whether this person does this occupation in Singapore. And a particularly salient case of that was we also tested um, China accented English, so Chinese accented English. And as I mentioned, the, the three occupations that we asked about were English teacher, coffee shop worker, and maid. Okay, so maids in Singapore come from a very limited set of countries. There's the Philippines, Indonesia, and, and so forth. So due to visa restrictions, there are zero maids from China in Singapore. Despite that, um, the China accented English speakers got the highest rating, even higher than Filipino English for being a maid. So our feeling is that children are reacting to the overall prestige of the accent rather than their prior experience with who is actually a maid in Singapore. Okay, so that can explain then why we get these results for English teacher, where the children are rating Australian English speakers as far more likely to be English teachers than Singapore English speakers, despite the fact that it's highly unlikely that these children have had an Australian English teacher. Um, something else I want to mention though, is that um, we also correlated these results with the regional identification task. So we, we also had these same participants um, try and identify where speakers were from, right? So most of these children could identify Australian English, but when, when we compared the children who don't, they can't recognize Australian English with those who can. So the children who don't recognize that the Australian speaker is from Australia, they rate those speakers as just as likely or unlikely to be English teachers as those from Singapore. So in other words, there's nothing inherently better about the Australian English accent that leads children to conclude that this speaker must be an English teacher. It's not that the English sounds better or more fluent or something. So when they don't know that that's an Australian accent, they're not sure if that's an English teacher. 
But once they've reached the point where they know, oh, this person is from Australia, they say, therefore, they're likely to be an English teacher, because in my experience, um, people in Singapore who are from Australia tend to be doing those types of jobs or, you know, high, high prestige jobs. Um, so that seems to be what's going on there. So we, we found that very interesting that there's nothing inherently better about the Australian English accent. It's just its association with, with Australia. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Can I ask a, a like related question? I was wondering at some point whether the children uh, were thinking if you have a Singaporean accent, you can be a wide range of teachers if you have a teacher, right? Any subjects can be taught by Singaporean English uh, accent teachers. So uh, could that have any effect on this rating? It, it might be. So yeah. yeah, so so the nature of the task right. is um, we for that task, we have one speaker. And then we say, is this person an English teacher? Yes or no. But the way that we presented the task to, to them was that, so this is actually a task involving animals. As you saw there, they were bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we said some of the bears, the, the nature of the task is a little bit, we, we tell them a story that the bears are going to the art museum to look at paintings and they talk about the paintings. And although the bears all look the same, some of them are English teachers, some of them are coffee shop workers, and some of them are maids. So maybe we can tell what job each bear does by mm. listening to how the bear talks about the paintings. So mm. they're choosing, when they hear the Singapore English speaker, um, they know that the, the bear is either an English teacher or a coffee shop worker or a maid. Those are the three options. And then we ask, yes or no, do you think this bear is an English teacher? Okay, so mm. given, that, given that the speakers that we have um, for they, these are all um, university students who are majoring in English language, and a lot of them may become go on to become English teachers. So, so these are the types of speakers who um, would be English teachers mm -hmm. in Singapore. They wouldn't be coffee shop workers or or maids. So, uh, so in that sense, it's a bit surprising that they were so unsure about it. But in in another sense, it's not that surprising in the sense that. Um, they think, well, this person could be doing any number of jobs in, in Singapore. On the other hand, so could the Australian person as well. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so that's that's how the task worked out yeah. there. Yeah, because I think in international schools, Australian accented English can be any subject of teacher, right? But English teacher is a, a I, I'm gathering that uh, the question was geared towards whether they teach English, right? Uh, so. It's not like yeah well the, yeah the option was not do you think this person teaches english or some other subject it was do you think they're an english teacher or a coffee shop worker or right, right right so yeah those were the options yeah just curious in singapore are there any australian accented speakers uh working at a coffee shop or doing made uh, you know that? you might i mean generally no um uh, generally no yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, you get very, very few um, working in service occupations, but generally speaking, no, no. I see. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Sangim Lee Kim from, uh, uh, from Taiwan. Um, hi, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a quick, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. I have a very quick uh, methodological question um so i'm i'm wondering how you coded the deletion i'm asking this question because um uh, based on my experience it seems hard to tell apart uh between uh unreleased tada and uh deleted tada so uh, how how did you mm -hmm. code the data reliably i i, yeah, I have the question yeah. uh well um, I did have um, some research assistants looking at this data and coding, and then I, but then I ended up recoding all the data myself just to be sure I was doing it consistently. I, I find that I, I didn't have much difficulty with it. We, I did code it as, um, I had three options, um, deleted and then um, glottalized. And uh, then yeah, unreleased, yeah, yeah. Released or unreleased T. So this coding ended up being like deleted versus not deleted in terms of how I coded it um, for the statistical analysis. Um, I found it actually wasn't too difficult. It, it's more difficult to hear the difference between glottalized and unreleased, I found. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I think my research assistants from 
Singapore might have found it a little bit more difficult. I, I, I'm not sure, I guess, because they hear a lot of deletion and they're not really sure what it sounds like when it's not deleted. Um, but because the quality of audio we had was pretty good and I, I found it wasn't that difficult. I think um, I think I did occasionally look at the prot signal to see if there were some unclear tokens, but I think generally speaking, it was pretty clear. Um, yeah, yeah. So for this particular variable, I thought it was actually okay. It was okay. Yeah. I, I think also, um, I know there's some previous work looking at ultrasound and other yeah, methodology just... looking at deletion, <laughs> because I think in like US and UK English, deleted tokens are often still kind of there in right. terms of our artists are there. <laughs> right. But okay. I think in Singapore, I mean, my feeling is that they're really not there. So I felt like it was maybe it was easier to hear uh, in this context mm -hmm. um, than coding because I think yeah in context like US English you get kind of barely there sort of articulation right. with these and and but in the in the case of Singapore they were just not they're not even making any kind of articulatory gesture so maybe that helped okay thank you yeah. so thank you uh, does anyone of any other person. I was also wondering, like you looked at TD deletion in uh, like focused, and that was really uh, nice to see. Uh, did you notice any other phonological features that uh, you would like to pursue further in the future from the data oh. set that you have? Oh yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> there must I've be a actually, lot, but like if you yeah. can pair a few, that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had some students working on this data, looking at, um, because among our, Singaporean participants, some of them are returnees, meaning they've lived abroad for a period and then came back. And she was checking their vowels to see whether there's some remnants of their non-Singaporean accent. And she, because often in outer circle English context, there's a stereotype that people who leave and then they come back, they sort of retain that other accent because they think it's better or something. Um, so there's this idea among Singaporeans, that people who've gone to study in, in Australia or the US, and when they come back, they'll sort of retain that accent. Um, so, so she did find that um, in terms of O and U, I believe the, the vowels, because those vowels are very monothongal and back in Singapore English, and she found that returnees do have a fronter production of those vowels. So um, yeah, in terms of vowels, I'm, I'm very interested in Singapore English vowels. I've done a bunch of language variation studies on them um, because Singapore English has a number of mergers, but it also has some splits. Um, it has a next text split in which um, there's a lexically arbitrary split between words like next and other random words and words like text. <laughs> so some of them, so for example, the word red generally gets raised to, to raid, but the word bread stays low as bread. So same phonological context, but yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, yes, there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on in Singapore English in terms of vowels. Um, another interesting feature is um, BOT of um, initial stop consonants. So that's another feature that uh, we're interested in investigating among these students. Wow, that's great. Yeah, so we will uh, we will be able to see <laughs> more uh, uh, work coming out of uh, uh, NUS, and uh, it will be exciting to understand more about how these uh, like younger population actually react on this and produce uh, things, uh, and also the background changes, which may allow us to understand better in terms of language change or how language will change. Yeah, so uh, let's thank uh, Rebecca uh, a little bit. Oh, not a little bit, oh, one more time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, let me wrap up the event first uh, before uh, we uh, uh, continue a little bit of discussion. If you have any uh, uh, things remaining uh, to ask Rebecca, I would like to thank the assistant Yuki uh, and also uh, co host Shigeto Kawahara. This event was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KU University and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. 
on uh, it's not part of this series, but uh, later this week uh, on Saturday morning, Elizabeth Siga uh, from uh, Georgetown University and Christopher Green from Syracuse University will share their research uh, at the ICU link, which will be the end of the uh, this season. Today's talk was the final uh, talk series uh, of season four of the KEO ICU Linguistic Colloquium. Uh, we don't have yet uh, a detailed schedule for the next season, but once uh, it's uh, decided, we will um, send you an email so you can uh, register again for the next season, and it would be good to see you again there. So uh, thank you all who participated in today's colloquium, and let's stop the recording before uh, moving on to further discussion. <laughs>